Can you hear me, friend? I sure can. Good morning. Good morning. I like your shirt. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I, I wore this shirt uh, when I interviewed your buddy, Tim Atwood, and I, uh, I asked him, I was teasing him, and I said, you know, I, I know you've done a lot of shows in Nashville. Have you ever been, have you ever done any shows here? He said, yeah, about 8,500, you know, so I, we had a little, <laughs> that, so, <laughs> and I know you, I know you're catching up with him. I know you've done about 300, so, you know, boy. Yeah, well, gee whiz, Tim, you know, was a piano player for 30 years. Right. I think probably 30, so ain't no telling, man. Yeah, yeah. All right, you ready for me? I'm ready. Awesome. Um, I just want to take a quick second to introduce uh, you to our future audience. Um, it's, it's really my extreme honor and privilege to be able to talk to legendary country music singer-songwriter T. Graham Brown. Um, T. Graham Brown's been making music since the 70s, but it was really in the 80s when things just exploded, and uh, he's kept busy ever since then. He's released about 15 studio albums and had more than 35 singles on the top 40 charts for Billboard. Um, three of them went all the way to number one. Uh, he was also nominated for a Grammy Award in 2015 for uh, Forever Changed, Gospel Roots album. Um, and he's just released a new album called Bare Bones, which we're going to talk about in a moment. And, uh, you know, just thanks so much for taking the time to talk today on a busy day for you. You are very welcome, man. It's my pleasure. It's always, it's always good to uh, have somebody interested in you. So. This is true, right? This is very true. <laughs> Yeah, I'm happy to be here, man. I'll be 66 next week, I guess it is. And I'm just trying to stay relevant, baby. And, and, and doing so you are, because I just see you keep so busy. I don't think the grass grows under your feet. I, all the different things that you've been doing during this time and before um, to keep busy and to just keep yourself out there for people, I, I think it's wonderful. So, You know, this year has been so whacked out. Um, we, you know, this 80s and 90s country is really making a comeback, I guess, because our calendar was uh, probably, we had the, the most shows and the biggest years planned in like 20 years, something crazy like that, uh, 15 or 20 years. And then everything got uh, shut down. So we were forced to kind of think up new things to do. And we started doing the, Facebook things, and we do a um, series of concerts to benefit the Troy Gentry Foundation. You know, Troy Gentry was part of Montgomery Gentry, right. and then he, he, was, he was tragically killed in a helicopter crash about three years ago, and his widow, Angie, has carried on, and that uh, foundation donates money to uh, breast cancer research, aid to military families, music programs. It's just a really good organization. So we've been doing some uh, benefit concerts. And the one, one good thing is nobody's out on the road much. So when I call my friends up to come over, there's really no excuse. <laughs> that is true. That is very true. Right, right. Yeah, so... Uh, if I can give a plug, if anybody's in or around Nashville Thursday night, we're having another one. And Larry Stewart, the voice of Restless Heart, will be there. And Tim Rushlow, the voice of Little Texas, will be there. And we have Mark Colley, uh, Ty Herndon. Gosh, I hadn't heard Ty's name in a long time. And I called him up, and he was just fired up about coming. Ken Mellon's the old jukebox junkies coming. Uh, and we had a special surprise guest, but the cat got out of the bag, and it's going to be Heidi Newfell from Trick Pony. So. Oh, yes, yes, yes. We have a great band backs everybody up. So it's at a place called Cahoots in Lebanon, Tennessee, and it'll be uh, Thursday night. You can go to Cahoots' website and get tickets or Eventbrite and get tickets. So if you're around, come see us because it's always a great show. That sounds fantastic. I mean, and like you said, that's the silver lining. If there is a silver lining right now is to be able to pull people together that you would never be able to get their schedules all to line up in a few weeks time to do something for good, to help people, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, man, these artists have sold millions and millions of records. So, so I think the tickets might be 30 bucks, something like that, Amazing. which is pretty, pretty cheap to get oh, yeah. in and see these artists up close and personal. Um, so it's a good thing we have a silent auction. You know, people donate things, and 
and all of this, none of the artists get paid. It's all, it's all good. It goes for a good cause. And so anyway, I had to throw that plug in there. If I wasn't up in Chicago, I'd be, I'd be down there in a second for that show. That just sounds amazing. You know, if I, you know, we weren't where we're at and I wasn't in Chicago right now. You could always fly in. I could. <laughs> I could. <laughs> so, but that, no, that's fantastic. And, and I mean, there's so many great things that, that country music has done to help people um, it, just in everyday life, just through songwriting, just helping people through problems, but also in a time like helping, you know, in the case of the Gentry family and in other cases, just to help people out in times of need. You know, I got, I got the sweetest letter today or email from someone that wine into water is really helping stay sober. And we were down in um, Mississippi Friday night, I think. Saturday night, I went down there uh, to make an appearance at a at a, re a rehab place, and I I sang uh, "Wine Into Water," and I always end the shows with "Wine Into Water." For those of you who don't or that are listening, uh, "Wine Into Water" is a, a song I wrote about my struggles with alcohol, and I, I th there's a thing down there called Hell Fighters. This guy was a bad dude, man. I mean, he killed people, he raped, he stole, he beat people up for money. Oh, he was like an enforcer. And he went to a revival and he changed and he built this huge uh, Harley place and he takes um, recovering addicts and alcoholics in and teaches them how to work on Harleys and, and turn their lives around. It's called Hell Fighters. Wow. It's a big place and, and they had a big car show there's about four thousand people so I always at the end of the show I tell people about my struggles and all and somebody filmed it and they used it for Sunday morning church in that place so I, I had no idea somebody was filming it and then I got another letter that's from a lady that was there and said she had five days sober and that song really helped her so that's you know my wife Sheila and I've been together 42 years, and that's kind of like our little personal ministry is to help people get uh, sobered up and stay sober. So it was a special deal I got to do this weekend. So yeah, you were talking about songs, the power. Sometimes you can forget the power of a song, but the the wine into water thing's so in my face all the oh, time, yes. and I'm I hear from people every week, and it's it's just the sweetest thing and um it's all a god thing and it really feels good when you um have your name on a song you know i was talking now here's something strange i i wrote that song with a guy named ted hewitt and bruce birch and they're both great songwriters ted's a great producer also and we wrote this song like in 1994 it's been around a long time yeah and Ted and I were talking the other day. The three of us got together to write another song. It's only, it, it was the second song we'd ever written together. And we were sitting around the table and Ted said, man, you know, when we wrote Wine Into Water, it's like I looked down and it was written. It was already on the paper. And I said, man, that happened. I, I said, that's, that's the way it happened to me. And Bruce said, that's the way it happened to him. So it was really a weird thing it's never happened before or since that the song was was there and none of us remember writing it so it, it it's it's really something songwriting can be very special it's powerful it's powerful when you think about that because it's almost like you the three of you were meant to get that message out to people it helped you later on in life when you made a conversion in your life in, and, and it's helped so many people since then. And at the time you were writing it, like you said, it, it wrote itself many, many years ago, but it's almost like you were meant to get that message out. And that wasn't the moment, but it was several years later that you were meant to get that out to people and how many people you've helped since then. Well, it's just nice to be the conduit, you know, there, there's an old saying among the songwriters. I'm just glad I was holding the pencil that day. You know? <laughs> These songs come from above. It's not like, hey, man, it's a total gift, and you can't really take credit for it because God gives you the gift to do it. It's like singing, man. I can't really take credit for, you know, my singing. 
because it's a gift, I didn't do anything to go out and earn it or anything. It was just a gift. And, you know, people, everybody has a gift. God gives everybody a gift of some sort. Sometimes your gift might be just giving somebody a smile that needs to smile. So, uh, you know, every I think every, I really do believe everybody has a gift. Well, and the nice thing is, uh, you know, you say, well, m maybe it's not something that you did, but you did because you accepted the gift. You used the gift. Some people deny the gifts that they're given, and they feel like they're being pulled in a direction to do something, either even, you know, in music ministry by writing songs or in helping people or whatever it might be. We all have a calling in life, like you said, and to be open to it is half the thing is, you know, and then it, then he can do the rest. So Hey, man. Putting out positive vibrations is what it's all about. Absolutely. You never know. You never know. Like I said, if you can give somebody a smile and it'll change their whole day. I mean, it can't. It has the ability to change their whole day. Sure I know. I've been. I've been in bad mood sometimes. And somebody flashed me a smile. I'm thinking, Wow, I needed that. So uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of ways to put out positive vibes. Absolutely. Um. I want to kind of go back with the, to the beginning of your career and just ask if there was like a specific moment that everything just catapulted. What was that, 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 that turning moment? You, you were working on music with a couple of bands uh, in the 70s and then in the 80s. Everything just clicked into place. What, can you point to like one specific moment when it happened? Maybe, you know? Well, I, I can't really pinpoint the moment that I wanted to start singing for a living. I started singing for a living in 1973. But we live, we have this farm outside of Athens, Georgia, where the University of Georgia is. It's about 20 miles out in the country. And it's been in our family for seven generations. My family, both sides of my family are farmers. I, I grew up in, ag in agriculture. A lot of people don't realize that. Um, I grew, I grew up riding on a John Deere tractor, you know, plowing and, yeah. and you know, that kind of stuff. And uh, helping my daddy, my daddy built a grain elevator and, and boy, he kept us busy. But I, I'll tell you, I went to the University of Georgia, but I dropped out when I was a junior because there was nothing there that was helping me in my singing career. Boy, I wish I'd have known about Belmont University and yeah, that's right, right yes. there on Music Row. I don't even know if, if Belmont even had a music business program, but mm -hmm. I urge anybody that's wanting to learn about music, come to Nashville and go to Belmont University, man. They, they intern you at record companies, and it's just a wonderful thing. But anyway, my wife, Sheila's got two master's degrees from the University of Georgia, and she came home. We were living on the farm, and we would just lie in the bed at night and listen to the radio. There was a station in Athens, Georgia, the country station. And we moved to Nashville in 1982. And I can remember, it's funny, cause it's his birthday today, Lee Greenwood. Okay. Um, when Ring on Her Finger, Time on Her Hands came out and that song came on the radio that night, it just knocked me just for a loop. And I thought, this is if they're making this kind of music in Nashville, maybe when she'd been trying to get me to move to Nashville and I was just scared to come out of my little comfort zone. But when I heard Lee Greenwood and, and knew they were making that kind of record in Nashville, I thought, okay, let's go. And so I've told Lee this and he finds it hard to believe, but he was one of the reasons that finally just lit a fire under me and 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 it's great yeah it is his birthday I, i'd forgotten all about that <laughs> that's so that. yeah that, that, i would say that was the moment that it it finally pushed me to go to nashville and and that's like you said you need to be able to share that with lee you know that, that you were able to tell him that and tell him the impact that he made and uh and you, the beginning of your career that's really a neat story well, he's been a really good friend over the years. You know, I, I tell people that I have the greatest job in the world. I get to make people happy for a living. And when I signed with Capitol Records, one of the first things they did after I tell it like it used to be became a hit 
they put me on the road with Kenny Rogers and I was out with Kenny for like 300 shows. That's a lot of shows to do. with somebody. And that was when Kenny was like the biggest thing on the planet. And I would open up the shows and a lot of times Lee would be the middle act. Okay. So I got to know him. That's the way I got to know him. And this, that would have been like 1987, maybe 86. So that's how long I've been knowing Lee. And we had a lot of great, um, middle acts at that time. I mean, I got to work with Glenn Campbell. Reba was on a lot of those shows. Tanya Tucker. Um, there were just a lot of good um, acts back then. I tell people that I came along at a great time. I came along at a time that I could work with all my heroes and they actually liked me. <laughs> I actually became friends with, I tell people I got to work with all the one name people like <laughs> Willie and Willie and Waylon yeah, and right. Dolly and George and Tammy and Loretta and Conway and Reba and Dolly, you know, all these people that uh, Merle that, that you know, just by their first name. And I came along while they were all still living Yes, and we're all still in fine form, and it was just a joy, man. I've had a wonderful career. I, I really have, and and I I thank God for it every day. I've never failed to thank God for it, and it's just been a a, a lot of fun. When you when you were going through those times and you were meeting brushing shoulders with people that you had heard their music and you knew what legendary parts of the of the business of, of country music was is, can you think of anybody that like really just as you were getting started one of the pioneers that inspired you with something they said they gave you a bit of advice on the side of the stage on the wing or something or before you went out after a show that has stayed with you because it really you think about it a lot well it's hard to it's hard to pinpoint something like that man because all the artists like that there were my heroes treated me like a regular guy they treated me like a peer they didn't look down their nose at me they were always encouraging kenny rogers always encouraged me and he was a great role model he was a great performer i mean he could he could and i'm talking about we worked every major arena in north america and he could take a twenty thousand uh seat uh arena and have it in the palm of his hand, man. He was just good. And he always gave me encouragement. All of them did. Or they'd give me a pat on the back and tell me they loved my singing or anything. And I, I would get to eat with them. Like George Jones, I, I, I can remember doing a show at a place called the, the uh, Cincinnati Gardens. And it was a show with George Jones and it was the first time I'd ever done a show with George. And he sent for me after, after my little opening act, he sent for me and I went to his bus and he was just bragging on me, man. And, and that's the kind of stuff that just knocked me out. And he said, he invited me. He said, look, this would have been on a weekend. He said, will not you come over to my house on Monday and I'll take you to eat lunch. And, Wow. So there I was, man, riding in the car with your his silver Lincoln Continental, and uh -huh. in the I was in the passenger seat. It was just the two of us, and I was just trying to look out of the corner of my eye at his sideburns. I remember <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to see his hair and his sideburns, but I didn't want him to catch me looking at it. Uh -huh. so, so, and we went on to have a wonderful relationship. He and Nancy and Sheila and I, he would call me son and I would call him my Nashville daddy. So uh, it's, it's just things like that. Absolutely amazing that you think about all the people that you've, that have touched your life and the people that, have, that you, you've touched their life with, with through music, through music, it's the power of music. And it's amazing all the, the, the stories that must be up here from all those years and, and continuing the stories continue today. You've, you've, been doing this forever and uh the stories continue there's still books being written you know the story's still being told yeah man well i got a project i can't really tell you what it is but it's gonna be really cool that i'm gonna i have to have it turned in by next march it's a recording project 
and I'm going to get some really cool people to sing on it. I know I'm going to have Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top on yeah, it. Wow. Sam Moore from Sam and Dave will be on it. I'm going to try to go have lunch in Memphis with Al Green and ask him if he'll be on it. I know Winona's already said she would do it, so it's going to be a really fun thing. So you're right, man. I get to keep going and doing fun, do fun things. And it, it's really cool. And, you know, this year has just forced everybody to come up with new ways to take yeah. music to the people. And we've been doing Facebook Live things that, that have just – man, we did one that's had almost a million views. Wow. Yeah. I, we've uh, – I did one that had um, Tim Atwood was on it. Uh, Lulu Roman from Hee Haw was on it, who's one of my heroes because I love anybody from Hee Haw. And Wade Hayes, if you remember Wade, and uh, mm -hmm. Brian White was Brian on White. it. David Frizzell was on it. Ronnie McDowell, all these people from the 80s and 90s. And uh, somebody entered us into uh, – uh, uh, how would you say it? They submitted us to a thing called the Telly Awards. I didn't know what the Telly Awards are. And dang, we won one. And we were up against Netflix and Good Morning America and all this, you know, heavy hitters. And so we've been doing fun things. And you put that together, correct? I mean, you put that together, yeah. if I understand correctly. Yeah, well, I hate to take credit for it. But yeah, I, I, I was... I was one of the ones, yes. But like I said, man, it's, all you got to do is call your buddies up and, and they'll be glad to help out, you know, if there's any way they can. That's great. That's great. Um, knowing that you've done you, – another part of your career was doing so many commercials and jingles and singing. You know, you had the long run with Taco Bell, which you know, for about four years, I believe, and then McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Ford, all these different places. Um all these different companies when you have you ever been asked to use one of your songs like something that you've written uh and turn it into a jingle for a, a brand no i've never done that but i've helped write some of them i mean i i you know i've probably done as many jingles as anybody in history i mean i've done golly kfc and dr pepper and seven up and mountain dew and, yeah all the beers, Miller, Strohs, Coors, all, all of that, Budweiser, all of that, just about every soft drink. I've shielded for just about every company there. I did Sometimes You Feel Like a Nut, Sometimes You Don't. Oh, great. I I'm enjoying it. Yep. Seven years. I have driven people crazy, man. They have turned me off so many times. They've, they've switched channels on me <laughs> way more than they ever knew. But, you know, I got a call from the – do you know who Ken Burns is, the documentarian? Absolutely, yes. He's done so much, so much. Yeah. Yeah, they're doing a documentary on jingles. Really? Yeah, and, and they got in touch with me. I did a Zoom with them probably two weeks ago, and they just wanted to kind of do some uh, pre-production stuff. And they're going to come to Nashville and, and talk to – well, T.G. Shepard did a couple. Janie Freaky did some. Lee Greenwood did a bunch of McDonald's ones. So they're going to come to Nashville and talk to all of us. It's, it's a friend of mine that did a lot of these jingles, that put together a lot of these jingles and produced them. It's a guy named Dan Williams, and he wrote a book. I haven't read it, but he, he got in touch with me and said, it's something, it's, I think it's called the, the, the World – the Secret World of Nashville Jingles. Oh. And Nashville, Nashville was a big uh, center for, well, you're in Chicago. Chicago. Uh, also, Book right, yeah. Book Cone and Building, I think, might be in Chicago. Uh, we did them in New York is a, is a big center for that. L.A., uh, I used to go to the record plant in San Francisco, we would go across the bridge to, to Sausalito. And so there's there's not that many that are really hubs of it. They, they, Atlanta's done some. So anyway, they're coming to Nashville and they're going to film us. And 
So it ought to be a pretty funky documentary. I had never thought about even, I mean, it never crossed my mind that somebody would do a documentary about jingles, but uh, apparently that's the case. There's a lot to it. I mean, there's a couple artists who have done like, you know, equal or less than you've done. You know, you've done just so much. I mean, well, first of all, Ken Burns comes to Nashville. You know, he's the country music documentary he did recently. He's going to need one episode just for all the jingles you've done. He's going to need to have one episode just for you because you, you've done so much. You've done so much in that business, you know. So that's, there's, there's a lot you could talk about with that. You know, there's a lot. Well, what it is, is I'm the dude with the raspy voice. Yes. And if they ever need somebody with a raspy voice, I always get the call. And that's just been the the thing that's helped me so much. Plus, I'm really fast in the studio. When I moved to Nashville, I started singing songwriter demos, and the publishers don't have much money, and they book the players in the studio, and they want to get in and get out. They want to cram as much stuff as they can into a day. So I learned how to just get in there, learn the song really quickly, and knock it out. And that was another reason that I got called is everybody knew I was good at that. So, you know, it's a combination of them liking your voice, you being able to save them some money in the studio. It all kind of dovetails. That, that's, that's, it's a great, it's a great part. It's like a hidden part of the industry that something like the Ken's Burn, Ken Burns documentary will kind of expose as being a, something that's really important to the, the whole history of music that this happens it's not just by chance how they how they put it together well you know man and another thing um i've gotten this I, i've I'm, a lot of opportunities i'm presented with a lot of opportunities even now i i um got a serious xm radio show yeah. on a on a channel called prime country which is the 80s and 90s channel country. 58 right channel 58 yeah. Yeah, Channel 58, and I, I came up with this concept of just playing. I have six guests per episode, and I play two songs each, and I go from concert to concert to concert. It's all live cuts, mm -hmm. and so it's like taking people to six different concerts. So it's been a hit, and and uh, Sirius signed me up for another year. So I'm going to keep doing it, and uh, I'm so I'm having fun, man. I really am, and I'm still – Sheila and I are having more fun now than we've ever had. The pressure's off. We're not out there chasing a hit. We're not visiting radio stations every day. And it's, we're, we're uh, at a good place. We're, we're at a good place. Now, when you do that show and you record those episodes and, and those segments, um, is there anything that you've learned about yourself in the interview process or any tricks that you've learned as to how to really connect. I mean, a lot of those people are your friends. They're people that you've worked with in the industry. So that well, probably helps to set it, but anything you've kind of tricks to interviewing? No, not really tricks. I just talk to them, you know, like, like they're, they are my friends and yeah. we just have a, you know, conversation. It's, it's easy. That kind of stuff is easy for me because I've been doing this stuff so long right. and, and you got to learn something. But you know what, man? I got to go because I got another Zoom call like in two minutes. Is that okay? Okay. okay. Um, can I just wrap up with you a couple quick things then bare bones? Uh, uh, Scott was I'm saying he's the – I'm glad you brought that up, man. I forgot. Yeah, we had a new album come out on October the 9th. It's called Bare Bones. It's an acoustic record. I've been wanting to do one and since we've been kind of locked up all year. I went in the studio and we did a guitar vocal of a lot of the hits. It's kind of like a acoustic greatest hits album. And I'm happy with the way it turned out. Um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm happy. I'm still rocking, man. I'm still oh, there's happy. so much going on with you in the YouTube channel and playing for events, uh, barbecues back, you know, doing things just to get out there and be doing music right now and all the things yeah, we, that you've done. We, we did a deal with Time Life Warner and they have uh, re-released a lot of our old albums and it's on all streaming platforms. So yeah, man, I'm trying to keep up with the, you know, all the social media, all the, all the stuff they're doing now. They didn't do it back when I was just yeah. coming up. So I'm, I'm, that's been a learning curve for me, but we're in there. We got people helping us out. Well, I thank you so much for, for, you know, your time today. 
And I wish you the best of continued success as into everything you're doing, your project next year, the, the Ken Burns project, the project with all these artists. Thank you so much for all that you've given to country music and, and for your time today. Well, God bless you. It's been a pleasure. And uh, God bless the United States of America. And go Tennessee Titans, baby. There you go. Absolutely. Thank you so Thank much. You. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.